introduce to you, Cindy Cleveland. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning and Happy New Year. And thank you, Robert. Um, the message is done. <laughs> really, you saying everything I'm going to talk about. So I was telling Robert before service that I've been listening to his music for a very long time and, and really didn't connect him and devotion until just lately. So I'm really glad you're here, and thank you. And I give a big thank you to Eric um, for the AVs, too. He's always real supportive. And my husband, who listens to me. Um, you know, practice the message that I'm going to deliver to all of you and then gives me loving feedback. So, thank you. Yeah. So, a wonderful new year. A new, a whole 365, well now really 347 days ahead of us. Okay. So this month we've been reviewing the, the basics and talking about new beginnings and empowering change. The first week, Reverend Julie talked about change and then asked the important question, are you willing to change? Are you willing to change? Is that right, Brody? <laughs> That's my precious grandson back there. <laughs> she also talked about the choice to react or create, reminding us that when we create, we're expanding. So it's a different place than reaction. Last week, students from the Beyond Limits class shared their projects with us, and I was in awe of their creativity. Yeah. And you know, they really showed us, they, they showed us how they put these principles into action, into, into their life, and they came up with these amazing projects, and it was the divine uniquely expressing us each and every one of them. So can you imagine living each day with expectancy and creativity? Ask yourself, what good will come my way in the next 24 hours? How will God express as me today? My topic this morning is treat and move your feet, the day my skirt caught fire. And more about that in a moment. One of my early teachers was Dr. Fred Vogt, and he used to say, kids, treat and move your feet. It may not just fall in your lap, but then again, it may. <laughs> in our philosophy, we teach a five-step affirmative prayer called spiritual mind treatment, treatment for short. So the acronym, and we'll go with that slide, Eric, if we could, please. The acronym for treatment, the, the five steps of treatment are, are you ready to receive? The first step is recognition. We recognize that God is all there is. God is everywhere present. God is up there. God is out there. And more importantly, God is in here. And then in the second step of our prayer, we unify. We know that we are all the divine expressing uniquely. It is not God and, it is God as. Greg Braden did a study where, using numerology, he assigned a letter to each number of the human DNA helix. And you know what it spells? Yahweh, which is another word for God or the divine. That's our DNA. <laughs> Amazing. Um, some of you know I currently work for the Colorado Center for Reproductive Medicine. And during my orientation several years ago, I um, was able to spend a day in the embryology lab. And I was able to look at embryos under the microscope. And a two-day embryo pulsates with life. I was blown away. Now, I knew the heart in a newborn was fully formed and beating in eight weeks, but I did not know that a two-day embryo pulsated with life. And then realization. We come to that step in our prayer where all that God is, we are, you know? Um, God says yes, and, and it's right in here. And moment by moment, as Robert was singing, we're using this creative process. And if you don't like the song you're singing, sing another one. 
right? So are you using this process for good? Ernest Holmes says that if our choices are not harmful to ourselves or another, then it's a good choice. And then we give thanks. You know, the universe loves to give to a grateful heart. And, and gratitude opens the portals of abundance. Meister Eckhart says that if the only prayer we ever say is thank you, that that is enough. Thank you. And then we release it. So what's that step all about when we release our prayer? Well, this is where we release it into that divine law, knowing that as we know it, as we speak it, as we feel it, it is done. It is manifesting now and unfolding as we speak. We don't have to know how to do it. We don't have to do anything else. We might be guided to move our feet here and there. But really, once we say that prayer, it is, it is divine activity unfolding. And we just need to trust that and let that go. So the universe always says yes, and it's always this or something greater, always. As you contemplate and create your new year, I am here to remind you that joy and well-being is the basis of this universe. We are here to enjoy. We are here to be well. Well-being is your natural state of being. Now, if you've had a physical challenge, you may say, yeah, well. But I'm still here to tell you that is the ultimate truth of your being. So it flows to you, through you, and as you. You only have to allow it. That's all. Like the air you breathe, you have to open, relax, and draw it into your being. So a lot of you know that I like to practice. And I'm going to now lead you into, in a short spiritual practice so that you can kind of understand and get what I'm saying here. So if it's comfortable, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes for a moment and just pay attention to your breath. Just notice, is it fast? Is it slow? Is it even, uneven? Is it shallow? Is it deep? And now mindfully breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Just gently and easily breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. And as you breathe in, say to yourself, I breathe in well-being. I breathe out with ease. I breathe in joy. I breathe out and smile. I breathe in love. I breathe out gratitude. <laughs> And so it's simple, and it's easy, and you can do this any place, any time. You can do it in traffic. You can do it when you're in the line in the gro at the grocery store. You can do it as you sit across from your supervisor having a conversation, or if you're about ready to talk to your teenager about something. This is a simple spiritual practice that just connects us, brings us to that divine center that knows what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. So. I don't know if any of you are like me, but have you ever wondered why you are not manifesting that which you wish to create? Anybody? Or am I the only one? <laughs> have you ever wondered why it is taking you so long to get what you want? Well, there's some things I can tell you for sure. It is not because you do not want it enough. It is not because you are not intelligent enough. You're the mind of God. It is not because you are not worthy enough. You are a worthy expression of the divine. It is not because fate is against you. Life is for you always and in all ways. It is not because someone else has already won your prize because there is more than enough to go around in this God universe. And there is really no competition. God doesn't play favorites. I have some bad news, and I have some good news today. 
The bad news is you are the creator of your own reality. And the good news is you are the creator of your own reality. <laughs> it is not possible for anyone else to create your reality or to walk your journey. Now, you know, just like we cannot walk another loved one's journey. So we have to do it ourselves, within ourselves, but we can also do it with the support of family and friends and people in our church community. So we have to do it ourselves, but we don't have to do it alone. Does that make sense? Learned that from a really good friend of mine. So Ernest Holmes says, there are no victims, only co-creators. Now I got to practice this principle big time last May. My sister's husband, Michael, was driving to work on his motorcycle one morning in May. A young woman ran a stop sign, pulled out in front of Michael, and um, he was unable to stop. So he ended up under her car. In fact, the car, her car was on top of Michael. Um, he was not breathing. He did not have a heart rate. Good Samaritans at the scene lifted the car off of Michael, and a nurse at the scene did CPR. It was actually made the news in Las Vegas for three nights in a row. It was such a story. <laughs> he was in the trauma ICU within 15 minutes. All miracles, one might wonder. I believe where the presence of God is, miracles happen. I also believe where God is revealed, healing occurs. So I give thanks for those conscious, loving beings that came to his aid that day. My guidance strongly urged me to fly to Las Vegas as soon as possible. So my younger sister Nancy and I flew within hours to be with my sister and, and Michael as he literally fought for his life. I prayed a lot and did my best to stay in the highest truth. And honestly, I struggled a little bit uh, with how an unconscious act from one person could change others' lives in a matter of, of minutes. And I prayed for that young girl, too, who caused the accident. Now, Michael is a kind and good man, but not necessarily a churchgoer. <laughs> And when he would become agitated from what the, the doctors would call trauma psychosis, I would ask him if he wanted me to pray. So he was on the ventilator for a while. When the tube was in, he'd shake his head yes or blink yes. When, the t when he was off the ventilator and I'd ask him that, he would emphatically say yes. And so we'd pray. And I've been in situations um, often where sometimes prayer was the only source of comfort for people, and that was one of those times. He wasn't crazy about the healing music I brought in <laughs> for him being a drummer in a, in a rock band. <laughs> um, so I got that tape back. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, he had more broken bones um, than I knew the body had. Um, he's currently blind from this accident and cannot uh, use his left hand. But we pray that he will see and drum again. Michael walked up to our door, our front door on Thanksgiving Day, free from brain injury, free from spinal cord injury, was able to walk to our door, ring the doorbell. Oh my gosh. It was like a gratitude that I've never felt before. Miracles or answers to prayer? Maybe both. Michael and Sherry have not spent one moment blaming that young woman who ran the stop sign. Recently, I asked my sister how this accident and eight months of pretty rigorous uh, rehabilitation and recovery uh, have changed Michael. And my sister responded, he smiles and laughs more. I think he might have something there. So if well-being is the basis of the universe. And we are here to enjoy. I ask you again, why are you not manifesting that which you desire? I'm going to suggest that maybe, maybe a possible reason is that you have, have not been holding yourself in a, vi in a vibrational pattern that is equal to that of which you desire. Different kind of thought. So it's kind of like you want to listen to jazz, 
and you tune into a talk radio station, different frequencies. Talk radio is, what's talk radio, Mark? What's the megahertz? 850. But really, I want to go to 101. So if I go to 101, uh, if I go to 850 and I really want to hear jazz, different frequency, I'm not going to experience what I want to experience. So it's all God energy. And the divine communicates to us in many ways through our experiences, our body temples, thoughts, visions, dreams, and most importantly, our feelings. Yes, our feelings. So for example, have you ever ignored a pain in your body and realized later that if you had paid attention and taken action, you would have prevented the cosmic two by four? Anybody? Or just me? <laughs> OK. If you will stop and think about it, or more important, if you will stop and feel about it, you can identify your every discord. So where am I not aligned with my divine source? Where am I not allowing spirit? Where am I resisting well-being and my natural joy? This takes an aware presence, a calm mind, a receptive being, and at times the courage to let go. And our spiritual practices take us to a place of reminding us who we really are and reminding us of the highest truth of any situation. So Mark and I have rafted and hiked the Grand Canyon a couple of times. And on our first trip into the canyon, we find ourselves in the paddle boat and we're coming up to our first big rapid. And you could hear it, oh my gosh, it was loud and scary and it seemed a little ominous to me. <laughs> And our um, guide wanted everybody to fall out and be rescued. Now, when I was 20, I had a near-death experience. I was sailing and got trapped under a sailboat and almost died, almost drowned. And so I was going into this experience with that experience, thinking it had been healed, but all, all kinds of stuff was coming up at that point in time. And I was happy to rescue anybody. The nurse in me loves that. And so, but I was not about to jump into that river, especially when I heard the, the rapids downstream. But you know, they, they made me. <laughs> it was part of the requirement. And so I jumped in, but I thought, I just can't let go. So I'm hanging on to the rope of the raft. And now what I didn't know at the time is if you do that, it pulls you under and you can drown. So by holding on, I had put myself in a pretty precarious situation, not even knowing it. And people are yelling. The guides are yelling, Cindy, let go of the raft. Let go of the raft. Well, something my little voice inside of me said, oh, I better let go. They really seem serious about this. So I let go. And in that moment, I will tell you, I felt a peace that, uh, like no other. It was like my fears from all of the years ahead of me kind of just dissipated kind of enjoying the moment, actually. Got rescued, all was well. And the lesson there was about letting go. And so I ask you all today, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you're holding on to something for fear of letting go? And maybe you're holding on to something that's really not in your highest soul's expansion. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. So everything we need is already within us. That oak tree is inside the acorn. You know, that, that baby was inside of that two-day embryo. Okay. Around the holidays, I, no I notice often that addictions seem to be more prevalent. And Addictions are a way, I want to just talk about this for a minute, because addictions are a way that I think people strive to find that feel-good place that is characteristic of our innate well-being. Well, the irony of addictions is that they cannot be satiated, and they are a mixture of attraction and fear, not our true well-being. So, so they kind of hook us, and, and, and they're very elusive. 
Gary Zukoff says that addictions can be a window into the soul if we let them. So if, if you or someone you love struggles with an addiction, and if, if when facing an addiction, if you're willing to do the deeper work and ask the, the deeper questions, this inner journey can, can lead you to your true power, your true joy, your true well-being. If you find yourself having an, an experience with, the, with an addiction, you know, I always say awareness is 75% of the journey. So that in that awareness, then, you can make conscious, loving choice. And I suggest asking the following questions. I call these, Gary Zukoff actually calls these questions of the spirit. So ask yourself, and maybe you're not even facing an addiction, but maybe you have impulses, or maybe there's something in your life that you're, you're struggling with. Ask yourself, does this choice or does this impulse, one, increase my level of enlightenment, two, bring me power of the genuine sort, three, make me more loving to myself and others, four, make me more whole. If you can answer yes to those questions, then you are making a high choice, a spirit-led choice. If you answer no to even one of those, it's just information that spirit is inviting you into a greater experience and journey of your true self. So sometimes we create resistance by not taking action. When there is a discrepancy in what we think, say, and do, resistance is the manifestation blocking our, our desires. Again, our spiritual practices bring us into integrity and allow our expression of well-being. Dr. Kathy Vogt was my teacher when I was in practitioner training. She used to say that meditation is talking to God, is listening to God, and prayer is talking to God. So I'm just here to say we have two ears and one mouth, just saying. And I have reminded myself of that over and over, to listen more. Listen more. One of the things that I have observed in us humans including myself, is that we can have a beautiful, peaceful meditation practice, say heartfelt prayers, and then fail to follow our divine guidance. We humans can be so interesting, can't we? <laughs> yeah. So I've been receiving guidance lately to leave my current place of employment. And I have prayed about this. I've meditated about this. I've bargained with the divine about this. I've had many discussions, and then I'm... Two ears, Cindy, two ears, listen. <laughs> and I bring in a good paycheck. Um, I have fallen in love with the team that I work with. And I'm absolutely elated when I help a couple conceive a child that they've been trying to conceive for years. But my meditation, my guidance, my, my prayers have been consistent. Consistent, and I keep receiving that message that it is imperative for me to close this chapter of my life as a nurse so that my soul can expand. So I've courageously taken the leap, and I am expectantly waiting to hear what's next. And I'm taking, I'm taking a little breather, and I'm going to do a lot of listening. And I'm going to catch up with myself and see what's next. Because you know, it's this or something greater always. And God is my source. And I know for sure that more time with my grandchildren is certainly in the works. And we got a new one on the way in June. <laughs> so, so what stands between you and a different life are matters of responsible choice. That's it. We stand between the two worlds of our lesser self and our fuller self. We do. The lesser self is tempting, I will say, and powerful because it is not as responsible. It's a little bit easier, actually. It may not be as disciplined or as loving. Um, so it calls you. So it calls you. And the other part of you, more whole, more responsible, more caring, more empowered, that part that taps on you and says, there's a higher truth about this situation. There's no need to be afraid here. Leap, the net appears. 
but it demands of us um, the enlightened spirit, the enlightened life, the conscious life. Do not underestimate the power of consciousness, people. <laughs> what you think is powerful. Don't underestimate the power of prayer, of visioning, of, a of action based on d divine guidance. Act as if what you say and think and do are important, for indeed, they are. You can feel whether you are allowing your full connection to source energy or not. So how do you know if you're in alignment or not? It's pretty simple. When you're aligned, you feel good. And if you don't feel good, you're out of alignment somehow. And now, this doesn't mean go get all judgy on yourself and hard on yourself, like, OK, I know better. Um, I know better, and why am I feeling not so good today? Lovingly, bring yourself back to that center, that higher truth of your being. You know, even as ministers and practitioners and all of us who study this wonderful philosophy, it doesn't mean that we don't have our challenges and our sometimes even crises. We have our human walk, too. What we do have through all that, through this teaching, is a tool chest, um, an array of tools to handle whatever comes our way, one, and two, to, to create that which, which our heart is calling out to us to create. Remember? We're here to enjoy this life. Our innate being is, is a, is a, is a well-being. So if you resist the connection to your source, if you're feeling resistance, remember that resistance is just a form of fear. And ultimately, we're choosing love or fear. So sometimes by asking the question, what would love do now? <clears throat> and Robert has a song like that, I believe. Um, it brings us back gently, joyfully, into that higher alignment of who we really are. It increases the vibratory frequency. So there's an array of frequency. So scientists have even measured the frequency of the body temple. And the frequency in megahertz is higher up here and lower down by the feet. That's actually been me measured. Certain states of being um, have different frequencies to them. <laughs> so if you are in any given space, that space will transform to the highest frequency in that room. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, some, of, some of you know about essential oils. Um, they've even done some scientific study around the oils that they actually measure the frequency, the megahertz of oils. And certain oils have different frequencies. And just by putting on an oil, you can raise your vibration and your vibratory frequency. Simple, simple things to help us be the fullest and the best that we are. So I'm giving you a gift today. The cards that I placed on your seats are daily reminders and a spiritual practice that is easy to incorporate. So on one side of the card are questions to empower our connection to our divine source of well-being and joy. And, uh, and then questions to consciously create your day. I use those every day. And then I do invite you to do a, sh a short gratitude practice before you go to bed. It works way better than sleeping pills. And the dreams are awesome when you go to bed counting your blessings, I'll tell you. So take those, use them. Um, so just a couple more things. It is through our ability to translate vibration um, that we are able to understand our physical world at all. So I took my little dog to the chiropractor this week. Peach is 14 years old and doesn't see her here very well anymore. I was asking my vet for suggestions about approaching Peaches so I don't startle her. She reminded me to talk to her as I approach her, even though she can't really hear me, because she can feel the vibration of my voice. Yet another reminder of the importance of vibration. And so, you know, you can find truth anywhere. <laughs> um, have you ever noticed another's energy field? 
Sometimes you can get a sense of where people are just by feeling the space around them. Or have you gone into a city or a town or a building and you get a sense of, of the vibration of that building? It's a collection of the consciousness of the people in that space. So every thought and feeling vibrates. Every thought and feeling radiates a signal. Every thought and feeling attract a matching signal back. And we call that process the law of attraction. Robert's saying about that too. So that which is like unto itself is drawn. Birds of a feather flock together. So we must find ways of holding ourselves consistently in vibrational harmony with those desires in order to, to experience our manifestations. The universe always says yes. So what are you affirming? What are you feeling? What are you giving your attention to? What are you asking for? God says yes. So I have a story. I have Mark's permission to share this. <laughs> and um, because all of us who practice these spiritual principles are also human. and. Um, we were going through a rough patch, Mark and I. And I felt that he was not listening to me or understanding me. And um, I wasn't happy with our communication um, or our connection. I don't think he was either at that point in time. And um, so always intending to practice the principle. Since I wanted him to listen better and I wanted him to be more present in our relationship, I started to practice listening better. And I started to be more present in our relationship. And you know what? He got hearing aids. <laughs> he, he was, it's not that he wasn't listening. He couldn't hear me. So two very different things, right? But now I could have gone down a whole other rabbit trail with that. <laughs> And holding my vibra myself in that vibration of listening and being connected to my partner turned that rough spot smooth. So back to the day my skirt caught fire. Several years ago, we were on the Sundance, um, so at the Sundance celebration on the Lakota Sioux Reservation. It was a hot, windy summer morning. Some of you have heard this story, but you know, repetition's part of my learning, so bear with me. <laughs> I had just finished an hour of meditation and prayer and was walking over to one of the gentlemen to wish him a happy birthday. I'm not sure how, but I felt something stinging my leg, and it felt like a wasp. And I looked down, I didn't see anything, but the stinging persisted. So when I looked down the second time, my skirt was in flames. I was vaguely aware of panic around me, and I heard Minnie yelling, drop and roll, drop and roll. And my inner wisdom guided me, if I drop and roll, this whole field that is so dry is going to be up in fire. So I felt strangely calm and was trying to no avail to get out of my skirt as I walked to the water tank nearby. All of a sudden, one of the, the men ripped my skirt off of me and stomped out the flames. There I stood in my underwear in front of God and everybody. I never once had a thought that I would be burned. I did remember thinking that, thank God I listened to my mom and I had clean, untorn underwear on. <laughs> I remember thinking that. And then I remember thinking, darn, I liked that skirt. And then Michael Hiroka, he spoke here a few weeks back or a month or so back. He actually brought me a towel so I could cover up, and so I'm eternally grateful to Michael for that. <laughs> now, the amazing thing about this whole experience, and Mark was there, he saw, he saw my skirt in flames, was that I didn't have one burn on me, not one. And when the Lakota would go to light their peace pipe, they would jokingly smile and say, uh, go ask Cindy <laughs> for a light. <laughs> so now I've tried to make sense of this experience for years. Um, I wonder what would have happened had I not been in that centered space. 
I wonder what would have happened if I ran in fear um, of being burned. I wonder what would have happened if I just stood there or listened to the masses to drop and roll when my innate wisdom was telling me something way different. For me, this was a life experience that showed me the power of prayer, meditation, and action that comes from that space. So in closing, Ross shared with me prior to service, I'm going to try to remember this, Ross. I really liked what he said. He said that um, Einstein was asked the question, if you had an hour, what would you do with that hour? And, he, and Einstein replied that he would spend 55 minutes of that hour thinking of the questions to ask. Is that basically it, Russ? Yeah. So I'm going to leave you with some questions. What do you desire to create? Start with prayer, meditation, and visioning always. Remember that your vision and your vibration must match that of which you choose to create. In other words, to attract friends, be a friend. If you want happiness, be happy. You know, I've heard people say, well, he or she made me feel this way. He or she doesn't make us feel any way. We are in choice. Now, this is where the practice comes in, because sometimes it's hard, because that lesser self sometimes would like to be mad. Or maybe that feeling is just some information for us, too. Just information, that's all. And then we get to make conscious, loving choice. If you're not manifesting your desires, change your vibration. Play a different song. Tune into a different station. Belief is just practiced vibration. That's it. Practice vibration. And if you find yourself on fire, treat and move your feet. Act from your divine center, your place of well-being. That is where miracles reside. Remember, breathe, connect, listen, pray, act from your well-being, give thanks always, and practice moment by moment, day by day. It is not a drudgery to do this, nor does it take a lot of time, pomp, or circumstance. circumstance. So, I leave you with a kiss. This is one definition of it. Keep it simple, sweetie. I liked my husband's definition even better. Keep it spiritually simple. Let's pray. <laughs>